but the nonstop rain is still hammering that state, leading to hundreds of water rescues. A brand new update is in from the National Hurricane Center in Miami. Let's go live to the Deputy Director, Ed Rappaport. Good evening. This is the 5 p.m. Eastern Time update on Florence. Florence has been downgraded to a tropical storm, but the hazards have not been downgraded. We still have strong winds, storm surge, and flooding rainfall. The center is now located inland about 50 miles to the west of Wilmington, North Carolina, moving very slowly off towards west in a general direction. Expect that motion is going to continue now for the next couple days. And here's our forecast with the center at the X here located just inland, North Carolina. 12-hour position, 24, 36, 48. That's where the center is forecast to be. Very slow motion over the next two days. That's about as we've been saying now for several days. And because of that, we have a very serious rainfall threat inland. At this time, we can take a look at what we've received so far. This is a map of the rainfall to date from Florence. And we can see that there are a couple pockets already down near Wilmington and up near New Bern, Moorhead City, that have had over 20 inches of rain. Large area of North Carolina, eastern North Carolina, is 5 to 10 inches. And you can see now the rain is going to be spreading to the west. They've already had 2 to 3 inches as far to the west as Lumberton, North Carolina. And some of that rain is now spreading into South Carolina as well. This whole pattern will grow to the west over the next couple of days. And by the time that it's all through, we're still looking at totals that could be now, we've already seen over 20, but as high as 40 inches over the, southern, the southeastern part of North Carolina, and then a large area, 6 to 10 inches, covering much of the northern part of South Carolina and almost all of North Carolina. So again, we have several threats still in play, even though the winds have decreased a bit. We have the rain in the inland areas flowing down towards the coast, and we still have storm surge risk along the coast, although the winds have come down Particularly up the rivers, there's still a threat of storm surge of as much as 8 to 12 feet, somewhat lesser values to the north and south. So still a dangerous situation for storm surge, increasing flooding risk for rainfall in the inland areas. At the National Hurricane Center, I'm Ed Rappaport. Thanks very much. A live look now. This is New Bern, North Carolina. One thing we've noticed over the past 24 hours or so, the worst of this storm seems to have come in the inland areas where a river was connected to the Atlantic Ocean. That's the case here in New Bern. New Bern is a town that's just inland by eight or 10 miles. It's right on the river. It flooded. Uh, there were hundreds of high water rescues uh, overnight into the early morning and early afternoon hours. Everyone who was trapped is now safe, but these are boats along the new river there, uh, the Noose River that were, uh, well, beaten up as were so many of the residents there. Spoke with one man earlier today who said he made a mistake by staying behind, a mistake he will not make again. The storm turned deadly today. Officials in North Carolina blaming F Florence for at least four deaths. Among them, a mother and infant child who died when a tree fell on their home in Wilmington. Let's get a check on conditions right now along the North Carolina coast. Steve Harrigan live in North Topsail Beach. Steve? A 
lot of damage assessment yet to be done. Steve Harrigan, North Topsail Beach, that entire area of the coastline has really been battered for the past 10 hours. Let's go down the coast, south of there, into the South Carolina. Jonathan Hunt is in North Myrtle Beach. Jonathan? Shep, far better situation here in South Carolina than it is for Steve Harrigan and the rest of the residents of North Carolina. In fact, coastal South Carolina, at least, may indeed have dodged a bullet. The storm surge that had been talked about doesn't look now as though it will happen. And the reason for that, Shep, is that we ended up on the, if you like, the bottom end of the hurricane storm as you look at it on a map. That meant the winds, by the time they were coming through here at their height, were pushing offshore, in other words, going from land onto the ocean and literally pushing the ocean back. So that prevents a storm surge. We did get some minor damage from the wind gusts that we had here. Uh, we've seen a bunch of trees down in the area, uh, cut a little bit of damage on a couple of homes that you see along the beachfront here, but no major damage whatsoever. But coastal South Carolina is one thing. Inland South Carolina could yet be another. This rain that we're seeing coming down still very hard here is predicted to last for at least another 24, perhaps 36, even 48 hours, Shep. And as you go inland, that's where the storm is moving across inland South Carolina now. And remember, all those rivers that have uh, seen this swell in North Carolina, many of those drain out through South Carolina. So officials are saying that while we got through the worst of it in terms of a wind event, this is still very much a dangerous water event for inland South Carolina. So everybody re needs to remain very cautious and be very careful over the next 48 hours at least, Shep. Thanks very much. Teams have made hundreds of water rescues and lots of them in inland cities where the rivers have been rising. Crews in boats picking up some stranded people and some pets. Would you look at these two? This rescue was live in the last hour. Uh, equal time now for the cats. Uh, they found these two cats while wandering around on the boats in this neighborhood in Jacksonville, North Carolina. Jacksonville is another of those cities that's inland on a river. The flooding extreme there in Jacksonville, in many cases up to your waist inside people's homes. They're making it so that those cats can get back safe to land. People and pets returning to normal. The North Carolina governor, Roy Moore, right now giving a live update on this storm. Let's listen. And other first responders have rescued hundreds of people in New Bern. Teams from local areas, other states, and the Coast Guard are responding to calls for help, and they are conducting searches of the flooded areas. Even as the storm still rages, if people need help, these rescuers are, rescuers are going out there and doing their best to get to them. More flooding will occur in eastern North Carolina, as well as areas from Fayetteville through the Sand Hills all the way to Charlotte. Some of these areas have not flooded before. If you live in any of these areas, Pay close attention to the flood warnings and be prepared to evacuate quickly. Rains will be starting this weekend in western North Carolina as well, where they could lead to landslides. And we're, right now we have about 650,000 North Carolinians without power statewide. And the utility companies tell us that this number will keep rising and they think it could be anywhere from a million to two and a half million people that could eventually lose power. So a lot of days ahead for the good people of North Carolina, South Carolina, and eventually up into Virginia. That was the North Carolina governor, Roy Cooper. So the headline at five o'clock Carolina time, the storm has been downgraded to a tropical storm with maximum sustained winds at 70 miles an hour. It's traveling due west creeping along at just three miles an hour. And the rain should continue in the Carolinas into Monday. The Five is next on Fox News Channel. Bless you, Lewis. Welcome home. All of Torrance was praying for your safe return.
This is a Fox News Alert. I'm Dana Perino, and this is The Five. Florence turns deadly as it continues to pound the Carolinas, knocking out power and trapping residents in flooded areas. Chief Meteorologist Rick Reichmuth is tracking the massive storm in the Fox Weather Center. Rick, what's the update as of now? Hey, Dana. Yeah, winds came down five miles an hour, so technically it's a tropical storm. I mean, at this point, we're talking about a rain event, still winds, and winds gusting to 85 miles an hour. I uh, want to show you this, something very interesting also. Uh, here's the motion. It still looks really remarkably well organized after having spent about 10 hours over land. You'll also notice offshore winds down around Myrtle Beach. So that means no storm surge has happened there at all. In fact, water being pushed off the coast. It's being on pushed onto the coast uh, anywhere just to the north there around Wilmington uh, over towards Wrightsville Beach. And there's the center of the storm. Since it came on shore this morning, about 10 hours ago, center of the storm has moved 36 miles, not far at all. Because of that, we're seeing such heavy rainfall fall in the same spots for so long, and the flooding is really piling up. We're also continuing to watch the onshore flow. That means a storm surge that came on shore with the storm can't really back out, and that's why we think we'll go through various high tide cycles uh, with that uh, water really, really high. I want to point this out, this band of storms, this is very similar to what happened with Harvey in Houston. Houston was nowhere near the center of the storm, but it had these steady rain bands that are dumping maybe three to five inches of rain an hour across the same spot. So New Bern, where we've seen so much damage and flooding down towards Moorhead City, you've been right under those lines of storms for the last, well, a better part of, say, 10 to 18 hours now. Uh, and looks like you're not going to get out of it anytime soon. This is rainfall accumulation through tomorrow. Heaviest here across southern parts of North Carolina, heading in towards South Carolina as well. Sunday, that moisture moves in across parts of the mountainous region. And that's where I think things are also going to be very scary for us. Not only is that ground saturated, but it has to pull back out to sea. So let me show you how this all plays out. Here's the moisture. Here's where we've got the rain right now. Once it gets back here across this higher elevation, all of that water is going to go down in across these rivers and these tributaries. And the folks that do the hydrology forecast, that's the river forecast. Here is Little River, where we are right now. This is where we expect this to be by the time we get towards, say, Monday and Tuesday. We're going to be well above the record levels we've ever seen at that gauge, at that station along Little River. I just want to show you a couple more of these rivers, the same story. So if we're down here right now and you think we got a lot of flooding going on, get ready. These rivers are all going to rise over the next number of days. And by the time we get to, say, towards Sunday and Monday, we're going to be seeing a lot of these rivers go up a high amount and well above their record stage. And then take a look at that. It looks like we're going to stay at that record stage for a number of days. So a long duration event. The rain is here. We've got a lot of rain to go through the weekend. And then those rivers, as it all funnels into the rivers, we're going to watch a major river, river flooding disaster across much of the Carolinas. Rick, then can I ask you a quick question about yep. that? Were people that living in those areas, did they evacuate? Well, hopefully people evacuated. The problem that always happens with this, if you live in a floodplain or place that uh, you might think I don't flood, but you've never seen flooding like this happen. We're probably talking about a 1,000 year flood coming here. So you might think you're normally OK. But uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of people did evacuate. And I think we people certainly had enough time to, to heed the warnings with this. Certainly there will be some people who haven't, though, and uh, they're going to be hurting. All right, Rick, thank you for that. Yeah, and you now bet. for the latest on the federal government plans to help those hit by Florence, let's bring in Deputy Administrator of FEMA, Dr. Daniel Kanuski. It's good to see you, of course. Daniel, um, thank you so much for being here. What do you have as a report today in terms of federal government efforts? Well, thank you, Dana. I appreciate you having me and good to see you as well. Well, right now we are very focused on the response phase of this disaster. We've been preparing for a week and now we're ready to go. We have prepositioned assets all up the East Coast. We're talking Georgia to Maryland. And that includes personnel, equipment, commodities, especially these swift water rescue teams. We have those from all over the nation have descended on the area. They're ready to go if needed, but we just have to wait for those tropical storm force winds to subside before we get into those areas with our high water trucks that we've got from the National Guard and the Department of Defense overall, as well as our state and local partners. I mean, they're the ones on the front lines. They're the ones that we are supporting throughout this disaster. All right, well, we have a few questions for you. We're gonna to go to Geraldo next. What do you think uh, about this inland flooding? We're kind of used to the, you know, the oceans uh, and the tides and the storm surge and so forth. But it seems to me that what you're looking at now, the, the fabled rivers of North Carolina becoming a wicked enemy of the people. 
Sorry, I lost the audio. What was the question? All right. So, <laughs> Geraldo, that was a great question. It was but, a very um, kind of a poetic oh, question. That was Geraldo's right. question. Uh, can you hear us Wait, now, Dan? Can, can you hear I got you, you now. Yes, exactly. What I got about you now. the river flooding? It seems uh, that you have less experience with that. Can they get the word out? Are folks uh, lethargic uh, about if they're inland? Oh, no, it can't possibly affect me in that, uh, in that profound way. Uh, you know, we're used to the ocean and used to these shots of the surf blowing and reporters holding out the poles and so forth. But it seems to me that what you're facing is a big water event. Do people get that? The fact that they, they can have a, a yard of water, a three feet of water in their yard, in their basement, in their first floor? That's right. Well, I'm glad you repeated the question because it's a great one. <laughs> we are very concerned right now still with the storm surge. The storm surge is that water that we just saw coming uh, across the coast. That kills. It's so dangerous. It's the most deadliest part of this hurricane is the storm surge. But then as it moves inland, what happens? A lot of rain, a lot of rain over an extended period, as we heard. It's not measured in inches. It's measured in feet. And people don't understand that rain kills. I mean, when it comes up, as you said, multiple feet, if you're in a low lying area, it can it can be very, very deadly. So, yes, inland flooding will be a top concern now and several days into the future. One last question from Katie Pavlich. Hey, Daniel, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, I think people are interested in the logistical aspects of how FEMA works with you know, local volunteers or the supply chain manager of all of the supplies that you have ready and waiting to go. Can you talk a little bit about the partnership between FEMA uh, and local officials combined with local volunteers to get people the relief that they need? Absolutely, and good to see you as well, Katie. Yes, on the ground, it's our state and local officials. So those are the state and local emergency managers. But it's also, as you mentioned, those non-governmental organizations. None of us could do this without the NGOs. I have the American Red Cross sitting right here. They are embedded with us here at headquarters, and they're embedded everywhere down in the field to help with sheltering operations, to help with feeding operations, and to help people recover from this disaster. All right. Thank you, Daniel. We appreciate your time and all that you're doing up there. We'll have more on the storm ahead. But first, the New York Times issuing a major correction over a story about Nikki Haley. That's next. Your insurance times for us make a major correction after publishing a story implying UN ambassador Nikki Haley dropped over 52 grand on curtains. Here's the original headline. Nikki Haley's view of New York is priceless. Her curtains, $52,701. Turns out, though, Nikki Haley had absolutely nothing to do with it. The curtains were bought by the Obama administration. Unbelievable smear and mischaracterization, Dana. Um, yes. And they corrected it, to be fair, but... And they corrected it within the same day, right? So it's that they didn't even wait till tomorrow, uh, although I hope that it will be in the paper That's because they well. got hammered all day for this, and when they do the correction in the paper, it's going to be yeah. really small right, right down at the corner. But thankfully, no with social media, notice. it's gotten all around, and it made its own segment on the five there in the is. middle of hurricane coverage. I, one of the things about media bias that I've complain about I don't like to complain about media bias all the time I think it's a little bit of a weak thing but that conservatives can make arguments that win on the on the merits but the uh, media will often do subtle digs and, and constant digs with headlines photographs and captions mm -hmm. and especially you'll see like pictures if they uh, for example President Obama has never taken a bad picture. Never. Mm -hmm. You've never yeah. seen a bad picture of President Obama. You can find plenty of bad pictures of Republicans. Right. Um, I think Obama's pictures with the halo in the background. That's looking a good one. Very majestic. Um, <laughs> but President Trump has some pretty good... He can't take a bad picture, right? Absolutely not. Uh, of course not. <laughs> um, but if he did, it would be in the New York Times. Uh, Greg, it said the apartment that she's in is $52,000 a month, about the same as your apartment here in Manhattan, which is pretty nice. <laughs> yes. Pretty nice. Um, no way. Well, 52000 a month? For the apartment that Nikki Haley is in, but it has majestic views of the city, and she has to entertain, I, I and hope. she needs security. <laughs> but I think the thrust of the article was, before they got caught, was Nikki's living large off the taxpayer, and the State Department's slashing the budget and shutting down programs, but they got caught. Uh, I would like to say it is curtains for the New York Times. <laughs> uh, this is actually worse than a mistake, because or a lie. 
because it's intentionally misleading. Right. The, the, in the story, it was six paragraphs down. I don't know if that's, that's fair. Intentionally well, misleading. Yeah, I think, no, Maybe they just way. bad report. No, no, let, let me finish. Uh, it, was the, it, was, it, was in the, it was in the article. It was in the article that Obama had ordered the curtains. So the story was ah. framed in a certain way that was misleading as if it was Nikki Haley's choice. Yep. So, they had, so they, somebody had read, read the story and still uh, uh, put that headline. So that, it, it's pretty scummy what they did. They knew what they were doing were wrong. And the only reason why they changed it is because there are people who scream media bias. I mean, it's, it's, media bias may come off as weak sometimes, but some people have to say it or no one will ever get called not, on it. I didn't it. mean that as a criticism of people who say media bias. I just say, like, I think that there is some obvious stuff like this. I do think that there are times when conservatives don't try to make great arguments that they could make and just hide behind media bias. And Katie, not only did the Obama administration pay for these curtains, the New York Times quotes I was an say Obama that. administration yes. official later yes. in the article yes. saying, oh, I can't yes. believe the Trump State Department is spending White all this House cash. official in the Obama administration is quoted on the record slamming the Trump administration <laughs> for on. cutting, you know, the budget at the State Department and saying, how can you pay for a $50,000 customized curtain <laughs> system for the ambassador to the UN? And it's like, you guys paid for it. This oh. was under John Kerry. Where's the question about that? And the Times did issue a correction. Yes. However, I don't think it actually was a completely fair correction. I think that the entire story should have been retracted because without Nikki Haley in the story, there is it wasn't a story. Yeah, and yeah. if you look at the language they use in the, the correction that they have, as you said, that will be at the bottom of the page, they say that they created an unfair impression when really it was a completely false <laughs> allegation and as Greg said, they admit in the story multiple times that this happened in 2016 and was already paid for. And so this idea that they used her photo, saying they shouldn't have used her photo, they're sorry for that, the entire story wouldn't have existed if Nikki Haley wasn't the center of the story. They should retract the entire thing and Geraldo, rewrite it. The most revealing thing about the article and about the allegation and about the smear is, you know, where I grew up, I grew up right here. So you grew up thinking that the New York Times was like the Bible, like, you know, it was God's <laughs> word. It, you know, uh, it, it, I did in my, in my, you know, maybe in your house, you did, but in my people. house we did. That or the and, post. To, and I remember <laughs> in, in Hurricane Katrina, uh, there was a, a story written that said that I pushed a, a, a rescue worker out of the way so I could be filmed uh, <laughs> saving a nun uh, in a flooded building. Then they, they, I said, that's a lie. Uh, you know, it did never happen. We showed them all the video, the outtakes and everything else. The New York Times ultimately reluctantly, uh, even after the editorial refused to correct it, the public editor wrote a story. That, yeah, that's, that's terrible. But, you know what that, but, just, but, I, but the revelation that they were just as political as the New York Post or any of the tabloids was, to me, was a, like a real disabusing. But why, why Geraldo's story is, is probably really most important is that you you only know about media bias until a story is written about you. Mm. Like people, people do not understand what it is until you are either interviewed or you are the subject of a story and you go, this is not how it happened. I swear this is not how it happened. Yeah. So you like, it, there should be a book of those stories of people that There's were, in, that were, that were said, yeah, it could yeah. be a, not just a book. It could be a set. Yeah, it's a set. Uh, <laughs> I was interviewed like by yeah. the New York Times. This is how this is okay. what it was. This is how it happened. Well, Don't get me started on Puerto Rico and, yeah. and how, you know, all these people that died in the storm in Puerto Rico that I covered for over two weeks mm -hmm. that I, you know, I, I a property owner in Puerto Rico. My father, one of 17 children, mm -hmm. like they say, all these people died in the storm. 70% of the power was out before the storm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So did, well, when, did, when did people start dying? When was it on, uh, you know, Hurricane Maria that the people started? Uh, was it when the power went out? Well, I, I was there one time, and there, it was a transformer Ooh. fire, and the power went out. When they started dying then? I mean, at what point do you recognize that what they're doing is a political agenda couched in the the nice language of, of journalism. Mm -hmm. All right. So you, I like when he said, "Don't get me started." <laughs> and then he <laughs> and then I get, started. Be good. And then I get wound up. In a yes. I have a short fuse. <laughs> right. While President Trump deals with the storm, Barack Obama is back on the campaign trail, taking cheap shots. Up next. Former President uh, Obama hitting the campaign trail last night. Here's some of what the great person said. When there is a vacuum in our democracy, when we don't vote, 
when we take our basic rights for granted, other voices fill the void. And demagogues get out there and they promise simple fixes to complicated problems. This, this is not normal what we're seeing. It is radical. Mm. He also went on to say people are stressed because of the anger they see on TV, which allows, quote, opportunists to try to exploit America's history of racial, ethnic, and religious division. Geraldo, that's a mean thing to say about MSNBC. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, uh, I, was, I was just thinking, it was daydreaming when you But he was were, talking, obviously, about Trump. Uh, uh, Dana's right. joining uh, my wife and I for dinner, and I will, Dana will see, and Peter will see, how it is in my family. Mm -hmm. How one, one half of my family takes one way, the other takes, and, and this, what President Obama is doing is demonizing even as he condemns the demonization yes. of American <laughs> politics. Yep. So. You know, he's, uh, you know, the, the, the language that he uses and, you know, the, uh, uh, the condemnation that he wields uh, is, uh, you know, he's doing the same thing that the people that opposed him right. and, 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 and the whole, uh, you know, born and after all. That's the same thing, only more elegantly wrapped, and I lament it. And his people have been saying that Donald Trump is the one that's tearing down institutions and traditions and decorum, yet... Barack Obama has gone out and as a president, a post-president, destroyed that legacy and that tradition of presidents not speaking out after the other guy has at least had two to three to four years. Now, he was asked this question as he was leaving office and he was asked, how are you going to handle your post-presidency? And he said, quote, I want to be respectful of the office and give the president-elect Trump an opportunity to put forward his platform and his arguments without someone popping off. Now, he is <laughs> popping off right here, and these are not statesman-like speeches. Nope. These are not, you know, you get paid a half a million dollars to speak in China or something like that to a corporate group. These are red meat rallies in swing districts. In Ohio. In Ohio. Where Cordray's running for How government. How dare he? And it's, it's just, it's unseemly, and the media is not not treating him the way they would treat a Republican president. Could you imagine oh, Trump yeah. after eight years and he's done, and then like the next midterm, Trump's well, going around the country ripping rules, people. But you know he one. would. He's yeah. gonna do it. He's <laughs> gonna these are the it. new rules, right? I mean, but these now are the President new rules. Obama, yeah, he said yeah. broken the seal. Yeah. He, he definitely yeah. broke the seal here. Watch yeah, your the presidential seal. Is that language? I think it's language breaking the seal. Uh, anyway, I think not. Let's get back to some language here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Obama's using words like opportunist. None of this is normal demagogues, uh, you know, promising simple fixes to very difficult problems. He did all of that, <laughs> yep. saying that this president is threatening democratic institutions. OK, fine, but make a better argument about exactly why, because I'm pretty sure it was Barack Obama who used the Justice Department mm -hmm. to not only go after reporters, but to go after small businesses and gun owners who tried to sell things and they would go after the banks to pressure them, the IRS, the EPA going after small farmers, that sort of thing. So if you want to talk about norms and have a real argument, argument about these things, Barack Obama doesn't really have a strong footing to stand on and paved the way for plenty of things that were not normal during the presidency. Dana, does this motivate people or yes. demotivate well, people? Well, it depends. Like, so I think that it would have been very useful for perhaps even Michelle Obama to say to the Democratic Party, Barack Obama is not coming to save you. Okay, so he is now a post-president. You're going to have to raise the money on your own or, you know, he could do a little bit, but you are, you got to find your next leader because he is going to be a post-president. Yes. You're wishing that she said that. I'm saying that she, yes. I, well, I think it probably would have been better for Democrats in the long run because if he's going to be out on the campaign trail between now and November, you know what happens on November 10th, which is the day after the election? You're on the road to 2020. Mm -hmm. So if he's getting all of the attention, where can the new Democratic leadership tried to emerge. He's taking up all the time. My sense was, and I, 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 I thought that, you know, I cried when he was elected. It was like the fulfillment of my, uh, of my adolescent dream to see a, a black man become president of the United States. I was so overwhelmed. I cried like Oprah. Uh, but I cried the, like Oprah. It, it doesn't seem to me that he had much traction in terms of uh, the, the Hillary Clinton campaign. No, it he didn't. Did it. When to he's not at the top of the ticket, he doesn't do well for that. So that is my point is that he's one that's not, it's not necessarily going to work. But also if, if he's having to diminish his post presidency by doing this for something that may not work. And he completely I don't damaged think the party it. to that. And that's point. why I say like Michelle yeah. Obama could have said, OK, you're not he's not, you're not doing this and I'm going to tell them you're you, not doing it. You know what gets me mad is that every time Obama talks, the obedient media describes him as fiery. 
It's a fiery speech. If he ordered like kale salad, the media would go, Obama fiercely orders kale salad as a fiery rebuke to Trump. A bold order. But they say President Obama is fiery. They say President Trump is angry. Exactly. And that's what I was talking about before. It's like the subtle little things. So like insightful. Little, so there's insightful. a theory that's going around, and I'm going to regurgitate it like it's my own, <laughs> that the reason he's so desperate to go out and campaign for the Democrats in the midterms is because when the Democrats take the House, if they do, they're going to shut down all of the oversight and surveillance of all of the FISA abuses that were going on in his administration. <laughs> this is the theory. Oh, boy, that's <laughs> very good. I that's think my, that is yeah, a you, genius theory. You had such good points going in there. <laughs> I didn't say it was mine. And now we have a conspiracy theory. <laughs> I didn't say it was mine. But I actually, I, you know what? I'm going to stand by it. I'll give you some credit. Info wars. I'll give you some credit, <laughs> <laughs> give you, give you some credit on that. The fact Info waters. <laughs> Info waters. Info waters. <laughs> I think we have a new segment. Info water. Info water. That would last one day. It no, would no, last no, one no. day. It would last. But no, the no. issue too is I'm that Obama, Twitter right now. Obama's back on the campaign trail. But when he ran in 2008, it was all about hope and change and a positive message. Yeah. But now he's just lecturing. Yep. And the issue for Democrats now is regaining Democrats who voted for Trump. Yep. And for Obama to go out on the trail and accuse them of bigotry and fear mongering and being opportunists, like those are the people who actually voted for you the first time. And, he was the one and that, you accusing them and lecturing them that is not gonna get them back to the Democrat right, party. And he was the one that lost those white working right. class, moderate uh, Democrats that have now left to go to Trump. For he his language and twice. his policies. He, he was elected. Right. Policies. They're yelling at no, me. He, he end, lost it for the last He did not hold those me. demographics anymore. We got to go. Catastrophic storm surge, force and water rescues, and over a half a million people are without power as Florence batters the East Coast. The latest next. This is a Fox News alert. Tropical storm Florence, as predicted, stalling over North Carolina, gradually plodding its way inland as it dumps endless rivers of water onto the stricken area south of Cape Hatteras. Four at least confirmed dead, including a mom and a child hit by a falling tree. Hundreds of thousands have lost power. Billions of dollars in property damage already inflicted by the slow-moving uh, storm. Let's go to Rick Leventhal, my buddy, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. So what's going on, brother? What's happening down there? Uh, it's, it's dark and deserted here, Geraldo, in Wrightsville Beach. More than 700,000 or almost 700,000 across the state now without power, including everyone here in this coastal community. But no one's here to use the juice uh, because it's, it's been evacuated. Um, you can see the lights are out. The traffic lights are out. We watched Transformers blow here last night uh, just before 11 o'clock. This is Lumina Avenue. If you know Wrightsville Beach, this is the main north-south drag. Uh, you can see maybe some power lines dangling in the street and a lot of debris down. This was completely underwater uh, earlier today. They set a storm surge record almost five feet above high tide. So we actually try to make our way from low ground to high ground. We wound up with, with water up about midway up the sides of our doors before we were able to get out of it. It, it was dangerous and uh, and it's a good thing there aren't people here. The, the police had encouraged everyone to get out of town, and it looked like people listened. Um, there have been fatalities reported, of course, in connection with this storm. Uh, at least four dead, including a mother and an infant child in Wilmington, which is just over the bridge. And the, the father of that family was injured and had to be rescued and taken to the hospital. So, you know, a lot of stuff is happening. Trees are falling on homes. Power lines are coming down. Um, the, the, the physical damage hasn't been as bad here in Wrightsville Beach because the winds weren't as bad as they had once feared, but the rain is coming down in some spots up to three inches an hour, and they fully expect catastrophic flooding, uh, not just on the coast, but across the state. You know, the, here the intercoastal met the neighborhood, but the, the ground to the west of us saturated. They had record-breaking rainfall this summer in Wilmington and beyond, so all the rain that's falling now has nowhere to go except up. Gosh. I used to keep uh, Voyager, my old sailboat in Beaufort, uh, North Carolina. I actually did an overcall and lived there for a little while. Uh, but let me ask you this. You're so experienced, Rick. You've covered so many storms. Give me this scary factor. When at the peak of it, compared to other storms you've covered, was it, was it something that you felt ominous about, threatened about? Well, one of the things that struck me was that that unlike most of the storms I've covered in this storm, people heeded the mandatory evacuation order. So it was eerie because there was no one here. 
and normally, you know, there's a lot of folks riding it out, and that really wasn't the case, at least here in Wrightsville Beach. The other thing was, uh, quite often when you chase hurricanes, as you know, you wind up nowhere near it because it takes a turn at the last minute. This one did come ashore right where we were, and the, the, the home that we were in was, was, was being pushed by the wind. I mean, the bed was literally shaking, uh, and, and the whole house was shaking. Even though the, it was only a cat one at that point, we were really feeling it. So had it been uh, what they had fully expected it to be a few days ago, uh, we could have been in a much more dire straits. Rick Leventhal, Dire Straits, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, you know, are you scornful of hurricane wall-to-wall -wall coverage? You seem gloomy. Well, no, I, my, my issue is always that it, it, it's repetitive. And I don't know how many times one needs to be told the same thing again and again. But other than that, it's very important. <laughs> oh, it's clearly very important. It's also always worse than you see it. it mm -hmm. As bad as you think it is or, you know, reporters are holding on to the yeah. polls and so forth. There's always more dead people you find. There's always more damage. There's a, you know, oh, my God, I forgot to declare my precious rug or my sofa or my children's closet is destroyed or my basement or, uh, you know, and all the businesses. It always, I mean, hurricanes are bad, bad news. Very, uh, it's dramatic. I mean, reporters like it because it's like war, but you're not getting shot at, mm. uh, you know, so it's very uh, it's exciting. It's interesting, too, to see the new coverage, you know, where you have social media yeah. and all those other and things that's to add into the coverage as well. One more thing, next. <laughs> you tried to out. This is a Fox News alert. Tropical storm Florence, as predicted, stalling over North Carolina, gradually plodding its way inland as it dumps endless rivers of water onto the stricken area south of Cape Hatteras. Four at least confirmed dead, including a mom and a child hit by a falling tree. Hundreds of thousands have lost power. Billions of dollars in property damage already inflicted by the slow moving uh, storm. Let's go to Rick Leventhal, my buddy, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. So what's going on, brother? What's happening down there? Uh, it's, it's dark and deserted here, Geraldo, in Riceville Beach. More than 700,000 or almost 700,000 across the state now without power, including everyone here in this coastal community. But no one's here to use the juice uh, because it's, it's been evacuated. Um, you can see the lights are out. The traffic lights are out. We watched Transformers blow here last night uh, just before 11 o'clock. This is Lumina Avenue. If you know Riceville Beach, this is the main north-south drag. Uh, you can see maybe some power lines dangling in the street and a lot of debris down. This was completely underwater uh, earlier today. They set a storm surge record almost five feet above high tide. So we actually tried to make our way from low ground to high ground. We wound up with, with water up about midway up the sides of our doors before we were able to get out of it. It, it was dangerous and uh, and it's a good thing there aren't people here. The, the police had encouraged everyone to get out of town and it looked like people listened. Um, there have been fatalities reported, of course, in connection with this storm, uh, at least four dead, including a mother and an infant child in Wilmington, which is just over the bridge. And the, the father of that family was injured and had to be rescued and taken to the hospital. So, you know, a lot of stuff is happening. Trees are falling on homes. Power lines are coming down. Um, the, the, the physical damage hasn't been as bad here in Wrightsville Beach because the winds weren't as bad as they had once feared. But the rain is coming down in some spots up to three inches an hour. And they fully expect catastrophic flooding, uh, not just on the coast, but across the state. You know, the, here the intercoastal met the neighborhood, but the, the ground to the west of us saturated. They had record breaking rainfall this summer in Wilmington and beyond. So all the rain that's fallen now has nowhere to go except up. Guys. I, I used to keep uh, Voyager, my old sailboat in Beaufort, uh, North Carolina. I actually did an overcall and lived there for a little while. Uh, but let me ask you this. You're so experienced, Rick. You've covered so many storms. Give me this scary factor when at the peak of it, compared to other storms you've covered, was it was it something that you felt ominous about, threatened about? Well, one of the things that struck me was that that unlike most of the storms I've covered in this storm, people heeded the mandatory evacuation order. So it was eerie because there was no one here. And normally, you know, there's a lot of folks riding it out. And that really wasn't the case, at least here in Wrightsville Beach. The other thing was uh, quite often when you chase hurricanes, as you know, you wind up 
nowhere near it because it takes a turn at the last minute. This one did come ashore right where we were, and the the, the home that we were in was 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 being pushed by the wind. I mean, the bed was literally shaking, uh, and and the whole house was shaking. Even though the, it was only a Cat One at that point, we were really feeling it. So had it been uh, what they had fully expected it to be a few days ago, uh, we could have been in a much more dire straits. Rick Leventhal, Dire Straits, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, you know, are you scornful of hurricane wall-to-wall -wall coverage? You seem gloomy. Well, no, I, my, my issue is always that it, it, it's repetitive. And I don't know how many times one needs to be told the same thing again and again. But other than that, it's very important. <laughs> oh, it's clearly very important. It's also always worse than you see it. Mm -hmm. it as bad as you think it is or, you know, reporters are holding on to the yeah. polls and so forth. There's always more dead people you find. There's always more damage. There's a, you know, oh, my God, I forgot to declare my precious rug or my sofa or my children's closet is destroyed or my basement or, uh, you know, and all the businesses. It always, I mean, hurricanes are bad, bad news. Very, uh, it's dramatic. Reporters like it because it's like war, but you're not getting shot at, mm. uh, you know, so it's very uh, it's exciting. It's interesting, too, to see the new coverage, you know, where you have social media yeah. and all those other and things, that's too, to add into the coverage as well. One more thing, next. You tried to out.